You know, sometimes I get a little carried away during worship. Uh, I just finished uh, reading through the book of Revelation, and I think uh, you guys need to go back and read it the end again, because every time we win, you understand that, right? Every time we win. And when you look on the news, it sounds like we're not winning, but we're, we're winning, okay? Because every time at the end of the story, we win and we get the prize that God has in store for us. So live like people who are winners, all right? Don't let this world put a cloud over you. You be the sun that drives the clouds away. By the way, happy Father's Day. Uh, I know you y'all got something special planned uh, for your, your dad, your, uh, no, same as last year, huh? God. All right, we're going to have to send the message out early next year so you'll be ready for Father's Day, right? Give you a head start. Uh, you know, when I think of Father's Day, though, um, so many memories that uh, go through your mind as a dad, um, and I guess one of the things is, is a, as a dad, there's so many things you're not prepared for, right? I mean, when you leave the hospital with that first baby, you know, you're just like excited. You can't believe that this is yours. And, you know, you're, you're, you got all these, these, these great, great ideas in your minds that you told everybody before the baby was here, all the things they'll never do, Right. Nobody wrote them down, thankfully, because you wouldn't have not uh, lived up to all that. But, you know, you leave the hospital, but the one thing that you really, really needed was the owner's manual. And that's the one thing you don't get. You leave, and they don't give you the owner's manual. Now, just think about the, the car you drive if you didn't have the owner's manual. They gave you a baby with no owner's manual. And so you just sort of have to figure it out, don't you, as a dad? Now, I know moms, you're doing a lot of figuring too. And thank God, you know, that, there, that there's, there's somebody else to, to, to help us. But I'm going to speak to dads for a moment because this is your day. We had Mother's Day. It's over, okay? We celebrated it, right? That's Father's Day. But I just, I just think looking back that there would have been some things in that book that have been helpful, right? Especially if you got girls. It should be like seven or eight chapters on emotions. Because it's hard for us dads, you know. They start crying and you're like, what's wrong with you? Somebody fix them, right? Where's that chapter at? Chapters. That would have been helpful. You know, it also been helpful to be prepared for those moments where you have to be the rescuer. That first time your daughter is screaming, you think somebody is dying up in that room. You run up to the room and there they are standing on the bed and there's this microscopic spider that you can't even see. Kill it, kill it! And you gotta find the spider, right? Who could prepare you for those things? You know, I think that there are so many things that's in the job description of a father is that you got to be that person that makes him feel safe even when you don't even feel safe. You got to be that diaper changer even when those reflux stuff is feeling like it's you know it's you got to be loving but at the same time you have to be the punisher when your daddy gets home and so they got to love you and fear you there's such a tight balance there isn't there and sometimes you can't keep the line and 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 you feel like you're stepping over you got to be the ultimate private detector, searcher, to find that toy that's lost who knows where. There's so many different things as a dad that uh, we have to have to do. And here's what I noticed is if you think about being a dad, there's probably not a dad that I know that really doesn't feel like they've done a great job. And so young people, listen, you got parents, you're sitting here. 
as a student and as a young teenager, in your mind, you think your parents should be perfect. You think your mom and dad should be perfect. Uh, you may not say that, but we treat them that way. We think that they should have it all together. And I just want to be real honest with you young people. They don't have it all together. They never had one of you before they had you. They didn't get an owner's manual. Because if they did, it would have to be different for every one of you because you're all different. God said you are uniquely and wonderfully made. I emphasize the uniquely part. Sometimes the wonderful parts, you know, it's, it's blended in there somewhere. But when you look at your dad today, young people, realize they're doing the best they can. And they wish they were perfect. But they never will be. But here's the great thing. They're yours. And they're there. And they love you. So give them a break today, okay? They're working hard. And you know, when I think of being a dad, that's really the picture, isn't it? Every dad, probably, as you look back and your kids get older, you spend too much time beating yourself up for what you should have did and what you didn't do. You spend too much time thinking, you know what, if I could do it over again, I would do it this way. And when you look at your kids, you're, you're, you're so concerned that they're going to go down the wrong pathway, that they're going to wind up a certain way. And those are the thoughts that flood every dad's mind. It is a burden that a dad carries that nobody else gets to carry because it is their burden that they carry because they love so much and they desire so much for you as their child to have the perfect environment. But in that perfection, they realize that they have to be perfect. And hence, we are not there, so we beat ourselves up. And every dad, if we were to get all the women out of the room and all the kids out of the room, we could have a man's talk where we could share stories of all the things we wish we could have, would have, should have done. And even as a pastor, I look back at those times where I feel like, you know, I, I could have done better in so many different ways. And that's really the life of a dad that we walk through this journey that way. And... You know, we, there are those moments where you feel like, man, I'm doing great. And then there are those other moments saying, man, I stink at this. I will never forget the story. It's not a story. It's a life event for me when my oldest son and I were riding bicycles. You know, as a dad, whether you want to ride a bike or not, you ride the bike, okay? Because it's about being with your kids. And so... Uh, we were out at the Bear Creek Golf Course that had closed down. Anybody familiar with that? It, the hills are, it's like this, you know. And I mean, it's like really steep. And you get going really fast. Some of those hills, you're on your brakes the whole time going down it. And you're trying not to crash. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to take my, you know, 11 or 12-year-old. I can't remember how old he was at that point. But he was young, had a bike. He wanted to ride. And so we went out there riding. And we got going a little fast. And he sort of veered off the pathway just enough to get his front tire in that rut that had washed out on the side. And the next thing you know, he was off the bike and piled up on the side of the pathway. And he was hurt. And I was trying to console him. And I was thinking, man, how are we going to get home? We're so far away from home right now. And so anyway, I think uh, we called my wife, Angela, and she came over and picked him up. And then I had him come back and got the bicycles. And, uh, you know, he's, he, I'm like, oh, you'll be okay. You'll be okay, you know. And he's like hurting everywhere at that point because that's what happens to start with. And a little while later, he's saying, you know, my dad, my wrist is hurting. Uh, and I'm like, of course, I'm, I'm a doctor, so I... I looked at his wrist, and, you know, I'm feeling of it, and I'm thinking, oh, it's just a bad sprain, you know. Uh, let's, let's, let's wrap it up, and you'll be fine. And so, you know, he, he was fine. At least I thought he was. And, you know, he kept complaining about it a little bit. Well, three, maybe, maybe four days, not really sure. 
we decided, well, maybe we should just take him to the doctor, the real doctor, not the pastor doctor. And sure enough, his wrist was broken. And I could see all of my Father of the Year awards going down the tank, right? Because I really stink at this Father thing. And I'm sure you got your stories. Because, you know, even as a dad, being a dad is just part of it. The other part of it is, is being that spiritual leader. You see, it's not just being a dad. It's what you bring to the table, and it's being that spiritual leader. And it's so hard being that spiritual leader when you don't even feel like you're walking with God the way that you want to walk with God, right? You don't even feel like that you're at that place that you want to be. And so it's a difficult thing. And, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to being that place where maybe you didn't even have the role model that you needed. And so now you feel even more deficient. And you have this whole list of things where you just feel like you don't measure up and you haven't put that much into it. And, and then on top of that, you got your own struggles with the things of life and the things of this world that are sort of pushing in on you. And you're, you're going through this whole process. Until you get to the point that as a dad, you're not even trying to be a dad so much. You're just trying to survive. Spiritually, you become sort of starving. And spiritually, you feel like you've, you've drifted away. And, and really, that's what I want to talk about this morning in this whole process of, of comeback. Is, is what do we do as dads? What do we do as, 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 as people in general when we have sort of drifted off the pathway and we can't, we can't lead others because we can't even lead ourselves in the moment? What do we do? And even as a young person, what do you do? When you feel like you've gone too far, so far away that you just wonder if you can ever get back to God. Some of you are watching online and you're right there. You don't even know if you can get back into church. You've been so far away. And there's so many things that push us to that place. Maybe you're that young person. You've been through an abortion and you, you, you just feel so far away. Or maybe you've been on, you're on that third marriage and you feel like you're so distant from God that he's not even in the picture anymore. Or maybe you're that person that you, you're still struggling with alcoholism. And if you get back on the wagon, it'll be the 15th time that you've try it again to become sober or maybe you're that teen that you're addicted to pornography and you feel so far away from God you just can't even sense his presence anymore or maybe you're that man and you got that gambling problem or that woman and you got that gambling problem and, and you've tried and tried and tried to overcome it. And you know, you know that God wants you to overcome, but you can't seem to. And so you've drifted so far away from God, you're wondering, is God even in the picture anymore? Or maybe you're that person that right now you're in an affair with somebody else that you're not married to. And you wonder if God will ever accept you again. You see, life, life has a way of messing us up so that we can get so far out there, so far away, that we feel like that we can't come back to God. And really, listen, if we can understand something this morning, it's... I want you to grasp what it looks like when God wants you and God drives you to a place where you have a comeback in your own life. Because this is what I know, that most people in their spiritual life, they're like this, they're up and down, and they don't know how to connect with God and stay connected, and we drift away, and we're wondering, God, where are you? God, how can I get back? God, I've just done too much. And here's the great thing about that story. Not that part, but here's the great thing. This book is filled with those stories. 
People tell you to read the Bible. You say, well, I don't read the Bible because your story is in here. There's probably a story in this book that you could put your name in place of the other person's name, and it would be what you're living out, what you're going through. And God put it there for you so that you would have a message so that he could redirect your life. Because even though you feel so far away, there are other people that have been in that same place and in the midst of that struggle, God did something supernatural. You know, one of the guys in the Bible, I like this guy because he's, he's a good Father's Day. Even though he wasn't a father, he's sort of a man's man. He's that rugged, tough guy. And you've probably heard Bible stories about him. His name was Samson. Now, Samson was probably, at a young age, the envy of all kids because he didn't have to have haircuts. I mean, he just got to wear his hair long. Why? Because that was what he was instructed by his mother who was instructed by the angel of God for him to do because there was going to be something special about him. But I want to give you some context real quick. Samson was born in this period of history. If you look in the Bible, it was in a period of history before there were any kings in the land. This is before Saul came along, before David came along, before any of the other kings that you read about. And so when you look, it was a period where there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of oppression to the people of Israel. And one of those groups that was oppressing them was this group of people called the Philistines. And the Philistines would rob them, would ransack their, their crops and do all these different evil things towards them. And there was nobody to take care of the people. So what God would do is he would raise up judges. Anybody ever watched the Judge Dredd Sylvester Stallone movie? When I think of Judges. That was sort of the time of this. It was God would raise up somebody to get the business done. And so here is Samson. He was that guy. Now, in this story, in Judges 13, 5, the angel told Samson's mother this. He said, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. And so he was, he was committed to God from birth with this Nazarite vow. Now, a Nazarite vow was typically something that somebody would do willfully. It was a decision they made. And what that meant was is that you didn't cut your hair. Uh, you didn't drink anything that was alcoholic uh, so that you could get impaired. And the third thing was is you didn't touch a corpse. I'm good with the third I'm good with the second. I don't have to worry about the first, right? But now from birth, though, this, this young man, he, he was committed to this, this vow. But it wasn't because he decided to commit it. It was different. It wasn't a willful stepping into being a Nazarite vow. You see it in the New Testament. This was something that God had done. And God said, this is what your son is going to be. He is going to be dedicated to me. And this is how we know that. And so then Manoah asked the angels of the Lord, what is your name? Because the, the dad gets into the picture here, and he's, uh, he has the uh, encounter with the angel as well. And so he wants to know the angel's name. Why? I have no idea, but he comes up with something. When all this comes true, we want to honor you. The angel asks, why do you ask my name? And then he tells him this. It is too wonderful for you to understand. The Hebrew word is pili. And so he tells him this. Why? He says, listen, if I, I can't even tell you my name because if I told you my name, you could not comprehend it because it's so great. And he's realizing that now I'm in the presence of, of an angel, which he, they thought that they would die at that point because this angel had appeared to them. And so the angel says, listen, my name is beyond understanding. So he had this encounter with a supernatural spiritual person. 
So we fast forward. When her son was born, she named him Samson. And the Lord blessed him, and he grew up. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Now, I want, I want you to listen to this. It was at this point that we see God doing something in Samuel's li Samson's life. And Samson was empowered by God because the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Now listen, as a Christ follower, that's what God wants to do in your life. That's what God wants to have in your life. He wants his Spirit to stir you. And say, so how do I know he's stirring me? Because it's the things that I do once I'm stirred. It's the life that I live. And many of you are sitting in this room. You have had that time in your life where you felt like you were stirred, don't you? Where you felt like God had something for you, that God had called you to something, that God wanted you to do something in your life that was supernatural. You felt like you walked closer, you talked closer. I mean, you, were, you, were, you and God were like this. So what happened? Right? Are you, are you still there? And... And, that, and that, that, that's the thing is, is are we still there? Because listen to what happened. When the Spirit of the Lord stirred Samson, this is when just incredible things happened in his life. It was when he was attacked by a lion. Now, have ever, anybody, anybody ever been to the zoo? Just raise your hand. You've been to the zoo? You see the lions there? It's not like Lion King, is it? I mean, these things are like massive. I mean, those things come at you. It's not like your cat chasing you through the house. This is like a for real animal. His, his head is bigger than half your body. And you're, you're a big person, right? And, and so this lion attacked Samson. And the Bible says that he grabbed him by the jaws and tore him apart. Probably one of the strongest parts of his body. Why? Because he was so strong? No, because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And then he goes on. Is that he once killed 30 Philistines as a payback, if you will, just to take their clothes away by himself. And then, this is the one that is just incredible, he ties 300 fox tails together. The fox is still attached to it, by the way. Sets them afire and sends them through the field so that he can destroy the Philistines that are chasing after him. Now, there's a lot of questions I have in my mind that when I get to heaven, I get to ask God. I'm probably all going to know it in an instant. Is how in the world do you catch that many foxes? I mean, maybe that's just me. I think that way. Do y'all read the Bible? And they say, oh, you know, how did that happen? I mean, have you ever tried to catch your dog when he gets out? <laughs> and he knows you. You got a snack for him, you know. Come here. You like begging him, right? And he's looking at you like, nah. <laughs> that many foxes. And then... One of my favorite stories, I don't know why it's my favorite, but it's just, this is, I told you he's a man's man. He was attacked and he killed 1,000 of the enemy Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Now, a jawbone of a donkey is pretty good size, okay? So don't think it's just a little bitty. Why did he do that? How did he do that? Not because he had a membership at Gold's Gym. Not because he was on the paleo diet. Because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. I want you to understand something, church, that our power does not lie within ourselves. that our power relies in, and lies in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when he is empowering you, you can do supernatural things that are beyond your comprehension. Do you understand that, church? Yeah. 
So when you walk out the door, don't walk out the door by yourself. Walk out the door with the power of the Spirit with you. When you have that conversation, when you're trying to be a dad, you're trying to be a mom, don't try to do it by the self-help book you got. Look at the power of God in your life and listen to the Spirit of God and there will be things that happen that you cannot explain. You see, that's what we need in our life, isn't it? That's what God wants us to have. He doesn't want you to walk through life with a life that's explainable. He doesn't want you to walk through life and all you have on your wall is, hey, here's my high school diploma, here's my college diploma, and and here's some extra uh, certificates that I got. He wants you to walk through life so that when people look at you, all they can say is the Spirit of God had to be upon them. There's no way that they could live that life. There's no way that they could respond that way. There's no way that they could have hope when everything else is falling apart. There had to be something different because they were able to accomplish this that's what you want that's what I want but unfortunately for Samson he had a problem in the midst of his life he's had this struggle and if you read his story his struggle was is that he loved beautiful women there's nothing wrong with beautiful women I married one but Samson could not control himself Samson's desire began to lead him and if you read his story he had one encounter after another encounter and then you read his final encounter with a lady named Delilah you know the story the song right And it was in that story that the enemy began to work on him. Now, now I want you to understand something. God has empowered you to walk in the Spirit. Our spiritual enemy wants to take that power away from you. You hear me? God has empowered you to walk in the Spirit, but our spiritual enemy wants to take that power away from you. And so here was Samson. He was doing all these great things. God was using him to deliver the people, but he couldn't stay focused on what God wanted him focused on. He got his attention diverted, and this one lady named Delilah, she began to ask him, how are you so strong? What gives you your power? And in that moment, he began to tell her things, you know, well, if you tie me up with these certain kind of ropes, then I won't be able to break free, uh, which was not true. He broke free. And over and over again, he began to lie to her. And then it says in verse 17, finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed. For I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. So what does Delilah do? While he lays asleep, she cuts his hair. Samson, the Philistines are coming, the Philistines are coming. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he did not realize the Lord had left him. When I read those words, you know what I think? I never want to be that person. I never want to be that person. Listen to me, Christ follower. If you're saved, you're saved. For all of eternity, you're saved. But you can forfeit the power of God in your life because you no longer listen to the Spirit of God in your life. 
And when that happens, I miss out on what God has for me. How do we get to that place? Because here's the thing is, when we look at the lives of Samson, he stood up thinking, you know what, I'm going to do just as I had before. But what he didn't realize is that what got him there was one little step at a time. One little choice. And he made that choice. And you see, as you go back through his story, you'll see these little choices where he began to have his attention, his attention diverted away from God and his attention driven towards his desires. I want you to know this, people of God. Everybody in this room, everybody watching online, you have desires that are not of God. You say, Greg, how do I know that? Number one, the Bible tells us. Number two, I'm a human being. Don't beat yourself up for the desires. You hear me? Don't beat yourself up because you have them. Just don't fulfill them. Because Samson... He began to fulfill the desires, and as he took the steps, the steps led him away. And I want you to see what happened to him after he cried out, and, 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 and he didn't realize God was gone. It says, so the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where, they, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. And so here he is, the man of God. He made decision after decision after decision. It wasn't one decision. It was multiple decisions that got him to the place where he realized that the power of God was gone from his life. But before he got there, he didn't even realize that the power of God is gone. And here's what happened. It cost him his vision. It cost him his freedom. It cost him his testimony. He was no longer a great mighty warrior of God. Now he was a prisoner in the dungeon and all he did because of his strength was grind grain. You know what they do to grind grain? They hook you to this big wheel and you're like a cattle just pushing it in circles. And that big wheel is just breaking that grain up, turning it into flour. And that's all that he was doing. And here's what we need to understand this morning. It's always one choice that leads you to another choice. And after you put those choices together, they will always cost you more than you want to pay. They always will. Listen, listen. The cost of sin in our life will never feel as good as the pleasure of sin. Think about that just for a minute, young people. Think about that. The cost of sin will never feel as good as the pleasure of sin, but the cost of sin lasts longer than the pleasure of sin. And what the enemy does is he wants us to forfeit the power of God in that momentary moment so that we can get to the place where we get to the cost of sin and then we realize I was tricked, I was fooled by the enemy and now I'm paying a cost that I don't want to pay. Anybody can look at that story and realize, you know what, I've been there. I've been there in this relationship. I've been there in this circumstances. Why? Because we have forfeited the power of God in our life. And so here's the thing with Samson. Here he is. He's in the dungeon. And, 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 and there's this moment in his life, though, where something clicks. The cost didn't go away. So dads, all those years that you want to get back, wish you could have, you won't get them back. You don't get them back. Teenager, all those years that one day you want to get back from high school, unfortunately, you won't get them back. That accident that you had because you were doing something stupid and it injured you, that injury is not going away. Why am I telling you this? 
because we need to know the cost before we step into what we think the pleasure might be. Because you got to know what you're going to pay before you play. Hear me. You always need to know what you're going to pay before you play. You're thinking about having that affair? Know what you're going to pay. You're thinking about it? Opening that bottle of pills up? Know what you're going to pay. You're thinking about doing that substance? Know what you're going to pay. You say, it won't hurt me. I'm sure that's what Samson thought when he jumped up and said, I will do as I did before. It'll cost you, I promise you. Why do I tell you that on Father's Day? Because... In order to have a comeback, you need to know what you're coming back from. You got to know how far you went. And you also got to know that once you come back, how to stay back. And so here was Samson in the midst of all of his decisions. It says, then Samson prayed to the Lord. Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh, God, please strengthen me just this one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. The most important thing in that statement is, is and Samson prayed. God did not forget Samson. Samson forgot God. God is not the one that cut Samson's hair, right? God is the one that gave him the strength and gave him the spirit and gave him the power. Samson made his choice. But now with one turn, with one decision, things began to change. And Samson was able to put his arms between, his hands between those two columns. And God gave him his strength back. And he pushed the columns with this big, huge party going on with all those Philistines in there. And he said, God, let my life end with theirs. And God granted his request. God allowed the end of his life to be a greater work than anything he'd done in his life because God listen even though maybe you have wandered even though maybe you have drifted God is bigger than your wandering God is bigger than your sin God is bigger than your mess up God is bigger than your past and God can restore what the harvest has been taken away by the locusts So don't sit there in defeat because you haven't arrived, Dad. Don't sit there in defeat because you haven't done everything you need to do. From this day forward, turn to God. Today is the day. It ain't yesterday. It's not. The day is the day. Listen to what God says. He says this. He says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's what God says. I knew on the day that you were born that you wouldn't be perfect. I knew that you wouldn't be the perfect dad. I knew that you wouldn't be the perfect mom. I knew that you wouldn't be the perfect teenager. I knew that you wouldn't. I knew even when you thought that you had to be perfect to measure up, that you wouldn't be perfect. And I gave you a tool in your life. And it's in this verse. You always have the power to come back. You know what God says with this verse? Greg... The door is open. Greg, the door never closes. You might wander away and not feel my power in your life, but I want you to understand if you just simply make a turn in your life, you can come back because that door will be open and that door will always be open because I will never leave you nor forsake you, says the Lord. And so I want you to grasp this this morning, that wherever you are in your life, wherever you are in your journey, that God is bigger than the mistakes that you've made, that God is bigger than your failures, and God is not looking at you saying, you know what, you're not worth anything because you're not perfect. Jesus died for you when you were not perfect. Let that soak in. Not because you were perfect, 
but because you were imperfect. And so what God simply wants us to do is to stop pursuing perfection and start pursuing the person who is perfection. That's all you got to do. When you turn, that's simply all you're doing. You're, you're redirecting your pursuit. I'm not pursuing that sin anymore. I'm pursuing the one who's perfect. I'm not staying over here saying, you know what, I can never measure up, so I'll just stay over here because I can never get any better. What God is saying is, listen, I can make you into what I want you to be, but you've got to turn and come back. There's got to be a choice in your life, and that's what happened in Samson's life. You're never too far to come back. Please hear that. You're never too far to come back. I want you to listen to this story of a person that you know very well in our church. But it's a story, I think, of a great comeback that God can do in a person's life. So let's watch this together. I'm Rod Sisson, and I'm here to uh, share my uh, testimonial and my journey with uh, uh, how I became the Christian that I am today. In my lifetime, I've had many um, obstacles uh, through my journey, uh, the, the most prevalent being the reconciliation of knowing that I am a Christian and that I'm also a homosexual. And how do those two things coincide? When I was 12 years old, my uh, mother uh, committed suicide and um, it was a very obviously a very traumatic time for me part of what I never told anybody at the time was you know I felt like my mom's suicide was a rejection um, of me because I was afraid that she knew that I was struggling with the sexual orientation when my son was born um, that it opened me up to the love that I had denied myself from the period of my mom's death. And, and quite frankly, when the, the, the day he was born, um, I was literally speechless because I literally felt the Holy Spirit filling me with love that I had not experienced in about 14 years. So my, my desire to find a church began early 2000s, but it took me until 2007, 8, 9, to find out about Crossroads. I'm so blessed to have my church family. Um, um, Greg and I have had uh, many one-on-one -on -one conversations about my struggle with how to be a Christian and how to reconcile the homosexuality. And Greg's lessons uh, to me, or his point to me, were very direct and very, you know, he says, if you, if you follow the teachings of the Bible, then you have your answer. And so, um, and, and, and it's kind of like to me, like a, an, an addict or an alcoholic, even when they quit uh, drinking or quit being the addict, they're still an alcoholic, they're still an addict. And in my situation, even though I'm gay, I can choose not to act on that, uh, which that's what I've done. I've been single uh, since 2002. By 2009, uh, the doctors had said, you know, you cannot continue to work 70 hours a week um, and, 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 and chase this money. You've, you're going to have to consider going out on disability. And I was like, how, how am I going to, with no family, no support, be able to provide for my child? How, how is this going to work? You know, and, 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 uh, and I knew that where there's a will, there's a way. I knew that through my faith it would work itself out, but I don't know if a lot of people know, there's not a lot of support for men with children, single parents who are men that have children. There's a lot of support for women with children, whether it's shelters or, or WIC or whatever, but men with children, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, or if it does, or it, back in the 2000s when I needed it, it didn't exist. Um, I found myself in a situation where I had to get on, you know, uh, well, I went from making, you know, $200,000, $250,000 a year to now I, you know, can't pay my mortgage. Uh, I had to file bankruptcy. I lost my lake lot. I lost everything that I had tried to hold together for 40 years. 
and uh, it really, uh, it really almost put me into a depression because I didn't know how, how was I going to get to the light at this tunnel? Where, where was the light at the tunnel? And it was through that that I knew I was in the right place uh, to grow my religion. And through my one-on-ones with Greg um, and him you know, encouraging me to go back to the scripture and, 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 and read the scripture and follow the scripture and pray about it, you know, I would find the answers that I sought. And, and he was correct, I did, and I have. Um, since then, um, I have changed my priorities of what's important. I'm no longer interested in the material things of a, of a big house or a fancy car or the lay clot. What's important to me now is the walking the walk, not so much talking the talk, but walking the walk. You know, I always talk about what would Jesus do? Um, and, and, and I try to pay that forward in, in my service here at the church. I've been volunteering for, at the church now for I think 11 or 12 years. Um, I'm also very involved in our community with an organization called CASA, which is a court appointed special advocate. I advocate for children who end up in foster care. I'm on the board of directors of that organization. Um, I've done a lot with United Way's Big Sister Big Brother program. Uh, I'm a big believer that even though there was uh, no one to show me how to make things work as a teenager and I did it uh, on my own, um, that gave me the resolve to know that that's what I needed to be able to do for others. And, and that has been more rewarding and fulfilling to me than any amount of money I could have made. In, in telling my story, you know, I, I think of uh, the story of Samson. I wasn't glorifying God. I was out doing, you know, what I thought was important in making money and providing for my child and missing the boat on what was important in glorifying God. And it was through um, the, the loss of all of the material things that I realized what was important to me as a Christian. Um, so in thinking about my journey with my uh, Christian faith and being gay, um, you know, much like I said before, that an addict, even though they may stop doing drugs or alcohol, they're still that addict. Um, I'm still that gay man. Uh, my choice to uh, not act upon it, though, comes from my faith as a Christian, trying to walk the walk and do right by God and be the best example um, of me that I can be for others. Amen. 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 You never too far to come back. You are never too far. You're never beyond God's reach. You're never beyond His love. You're never beyond His forgiveness. You're never out of his mind. He never turns his back. All he's simply waiting for you to do is to take your step. To take that step where you turn from whatever that is in your life and say, God, you know what? I know that I've got mess ups, but this morning I realize that you are bigger than my mess ups. That you're bigger than my sins. You're bigger than all the accumulation of all my mistakes together whether I was a dad that didn't feel like he measured, measured up or, or, or a kid that feels like that you don't, you don't measure up, God is wanting you to understand something that you can come back this morning, that you can come back to that relationship with Him, you can come back to that power with Him so that you begin to experience the freedom and the fruit that you desire, that He desires in your life, that you don't have to live powerless anymore. And all it takes is one step. And that step is to turn walk towards God just to simply turn and so this morning God's inviting you to take that step this is your comeback morning this is your morning it's not anybody else's in this room it is you and God this morning and he's inviting you back so would you bow your heads with me for just a moment 
If you're in this room this morning and you're watching online this morning and God has spoken to your heart and you feel like you drifted away, you feel like that there's been this gap there, you and God, and this morning you realize that forgiveness is available, that restoration is available, and you're ready to take that step, to walk back to God, to walk back to that relationship, to begin to pursue Him again, because you feel like that you've been too far away, but just realize this morning that you're not too far. You say, Greg, I am ready to come back to Jesus. I know that He's my Savior. But I want to walk with him again. I want to be closer again. If that's you this morning, can I just pray with you as a believer? Would you just raise your hand and say, Greg, I know I know Jesus, but thank you that this morning I'm having my own comeback. Just raise your hand up. Say, God, I'm wanting to be restored this morning. Whether you're online, just raise your hand. Just hold it up high. Dad, listen, feel like you hadn't measured up, but this is your comeback. This is your moment. Mom, God's calling you back. Teenager, God's calling you back. Don't miss your moment. With your hand raised, I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, that power that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth, God. And this morning, we are confessing that you are our Lord and our Savior. God, that that thing that has pulled me away no longer has control of my life. I repent from it in the name of Jesus. God, I repent from that attitude. I repent from that rebellion. I repent from that sexual sin. God, whatever it might be right now, in the name of Jesus, I am loosed from it. And God, I am having my comeback. I am coming back to you, God, because you left the door open for me. And so, God, this morning, I will celebrate you. I will worship you. I will walk in victory with you, God, because, Lord, I am your child. Put your hands down. For those of you who are here this morning that maybe you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know that Jesus invites you to come, to have that relationship with Him. And if you're ready to take that step, I want to pray right now with you, Father, for those that are in the room that need to take a step to invite you into their life. This is our simple prayer. We confess our sin. We accept that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave. God, we invite you into our lives to be our Savior this morning. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Church, let's stand to our feet. Let's welcome and worship our Savior back into our presence this morning as we have our comeback.